Um, well, thanks very much, Chris. I think Madison Lightfoot may also be on the call. So all of the staff are joining us so that we can follow up on any questions or concerns that we hear from those of you on the call. And let me begin by thanking you so much for joining me and talking about the challenges that you're facing. I, I'm sure you're doing, like I am, conference calls every day, um, talking to people about what our current situation is. It's a, a really uncertain time, as all of you know so well, uncertain for each of you as you're thinking about your school districts and what happens in the fall, um, how you continue to provide education to your students over the remainder of this year through remote learning, um, an uncertain time for families and for kids, for so many kids who may not have access to internet that is reliable, um, who are having other challenges with um, food insecurity, with their home situation. It's a really uncertain time. And I, one of my goals as I've been in Washington is to try and figure out what I can do that's most helpful to support all of you who are really on the front lines and responding to the situation that we're in. And that was my intent in the packages of legislation that we've passed so far in Washington. Um, didn't have everything that we all would have liked, but as we know, legislation is always a compromise. And as we think about another package of legislation that has passed the House and coming to the Senate, I thought it would be really helpful for me to hear from all of you about your needs as you're thinking about the upcoming year and the challenges that you're facing. So, um, again, I want to thank everybody, not just for being on the call today, but for what you're doing every day to address uh, the needs of the kids that you're um, involved with. also want to thank Carl and Barrett for helping us organize the call today. Really appreciate it. And as you heard, we've got a combination of superintendents, assistant superintendents, principals, school board members trying to get a, sort of a cross section so that I ha and a, a geographic mix so that I have a sense of what people are facing across the state. I, I will tell you, as I'm sure you have been following, one of the biggest areas of disagreement when we passed the CARES Act back in March was how much money should go to state and local government. It's one of the things that held up the bill for several days until we were able to get agreement. It seems like it will be also a challenge in the next package of legislation as we see what's coming over from the House. What the House has done is set up a very generous fund to go to state and local governments. I assume that even though that funding is not aimed directly at schools, there is some benefit to all of you to having the communities that you're in be able to respond to the pandemic in a way that um, helps to address the challenges families in your districts are facing. It also does have more money for the education in the House bill than was passed in the CARES Act back in March. So um, it authorizes $5 billion for temporary disbursement to be administered through the FCC for their E-rate program. It provides a $90 billion fund for um, state fiscal stabilization at the Department of Education to be allocated to um, school districts and states based on population, number of low-income students. Um, so I assume that some of that will survive and some of it may not. So that's why it's so helpful for us to hear what you all are experiencing and what you think is the most helpful as we look at the future and what your needs are. I'm going to stop there so I have a chance to hear from hopefully all of you on this call. And we're all bus busily taking notes and we'll be in a position to try and follow up with you and any, answer any questions that we can. So, um, Chris, are you going to go through the list of people on the call? Yes, Senator. Um, I'll open it up to uh, Superintendent Cataret. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to meet, to meet with us and your willingness to hear what we have to say. Um, I've been thinking carefully about this, and I think the main thing that I would like to share is a focus on sustainability. 
Um, here in the North Country, we are honored every day with the sacrifices that our parents and citizens make with schools as a center of our communities. And I'm reminded continually of what those sacrifices really mean when we have um, such high poverty levels in our areas. And parents jumped on. We were quite successful in getting one-to-one -one devices out to our families in a short period of time, having consistency with our curriculum. And I think families have made a lot of sacrifices to get Wi-Fi and Internet for their children and for them to also work from home. But I really feel strongly that um, we don't have complete transparency with families in what that would mean in the long term. They made the sacrifices to get Wi-Fi or to increase their packages on their cell phones or um, we provided some hot spots and getting Wi-Fi mm -hmm. for them. But I think in the long term, what that really means, they're saying when this is over, we're going to turn those off or we're not going to have those. And it took two weeks, sometimes three weeks in some circumstances, to get them Wi-Fi or for us to get the hot spots or the Wi-Fi pucks out to them. They want to support their kids. And I had teachers just recently saw a teacher sitting outside a restaurant to teach each day to get the Wi-Fi and infrastructure. Wow. So I think that what's really important is that w that we've gone for remote instruction. We are doing our very bu best to bring high-quality educational opportunities to our students. But when you talk about the long term, what does that really mean and families' ability to make those same sacrifices, yes, temporarily, they make choices to provide this for their families, but what does that mean in the long term? And we need strong infrastructure and the, the fiber optics to support that and have equity for all families and for all educators and all school districts to provide the best for their kids instead of families making choices about how much bandwidth they're going to use or how much time a child gets on per device. So that was my topic that I chose to really stress for today, that they have great pride in their families, they want to support their children, mm -hmm. they want to support our communities, but there's also a capacity of what they can truly sustain for a long-term versus a temporary situation. So I, I, I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we have, and it's a challenge not just in education, as you know, but it's um, in how do we attract businesses to parts of New Hampshire, like the North Country, that have had challenges. I've I remember when I was up there and we were trying to get cell phone service. So um, when you when you talk about families um, making the short-term sacrifice, I, I know that one of the things we have put in that's in the House bill, as I said, is some funding to help in the short term to deal with the hot spots and try and get equipment out to students and school districts that need it. But what I think I hear you saying is that what we really need is a commitment to ensure that every place in America has access to high-speed Internet. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And at this point, none of the legislation that is in the House that has been introduced, I'm on a couple of other bills that would provide additional help during the short term by way of Wi-Fi and hotspots, but that commitment to ensure that every household has access to high-speed Internet is not yet there in Congress. And I agree it's something that we need to do just as in the 30s, 1930s, we committed to ensure that every household could get electricity because this is a public utility really in lots of ways, even though we're reluctant to call it that, and we need to ensure that everybody has the ability to access it. So I rest you. assured that it's one of the things that I will continue to fight for. And if we don't, we're going to continue to have um, disparities and a greater divide in between the haves and the have-nots with equity and accessibility to public education for sure. Oh, totally. And it's going to get worse over time. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rana. Uh, we'll go on to Scott from Liberty in Londonderry. Yes, good morning. Uh, good morning, Senator, and thank you for allowing me to join the call. Um, I, I suspect this will be a bit of a theme, and, and rightfully so. I would begin uh, by recognizing the incredible efforts that have been put forward in the community of Londonderry by our teachers, 
uh, parents and families and, and by, by our students uh, as we had to make this kind of transition so so quickly uh, as one of the larger districts in this in the state larger suburban district uh, the, the, the logistics that had to be uh, had to be put into place in short order were, were pretty remarkable uh, we've been using the phrase we're building the ship as we sail it and uh, you can't do something like that without an incredible effort uh, by all uh, by all involved uh, to, to, the, to the point of, of uh, current issues, we're, we're very fortunate in Londonderry uh, in that we, we do have uh, materials and, and access to the Internet. Uh, what we are struggling with right now uh, is more on the logistics end of things and the planning end of things. Uh, we have a good plan to get us through the end of the school year. We have a, a good plan to get us through summer. Uh, we are struggling to make sure that our students with disabilities receive the services that we can provide to them. Uh, that, that would be one, one thing that I would point out my, my concern with is, is the ability to access those mm -hmm. services uh, without the, the advantage of proximity. And then uh, the, the second piece that I know uh, keeps me up in, in, at night and, and I think is of concern to a lot of us is the process of contingency planning as we look ahead to the fall. Uh, we, we don't really know what we are going to be coming back to and the myriad of different options present us with not only logistical challenges but also with fiscal challenges as we try to, to plan appropriately uh, and, and budget in a way that uh, will allow us to, to provide our students with what they need. Um, the, the, cur the current funding has been very helpful. Uh, the hard part for us in planning out uh, what's coming next is, is that we really don't know uh, the conditions for which we're planning. Uh, so really, the, those would be the two things that I would, I would point out of concern would be ensuring that our students with disabilities receive uh, mm -hmm. support that they need, and, and then, as I said, that long-term logistical uh, support as far as uh, the, the fiscal end of it. So I uh, appreciate you uh, letting me chime in today. Well, thanks very much. Can I ask you, you said that you, you feel relatively um, okay about where you are in terms of the rest of the year and the summer. What kinds of things are you planning for the summer? Because one of the concerns that I've heard from um, people all over is that the summer is going to be especially uncertain time because mm. summer camps are likely to be closed. A lot of the programs at the municipal level that parents rely on, that students attend, are closed. Are you working on options like that with the community? Yes, we are. Uh, and, and there are some uh, some areas, recreational activities and stuff, that we, we had to make a decision on that a little bit earlier than I think other people would have liked just because of the scope that we're working at. Uh, and, and we have, in a lot of cases, canceled and or are trying to reschedule or reorganize some of those activities. Um, but as I said, it's one of the things that we, we recognized specific to our, our town uh, is that we needed to do that further out ahead of time. Uh, from an instructional standpoint, what we're really missing is that in the, that in-person, face-to-face contact that, that's necessary for students for remedial needs, and particularly with students with disabilities, uh, for, for them to have what they need. And, and we're trying to make plans for instructional supports and summer programming uh, that is remote, but yet has, wherever possible, uh, the the person to person contact with appropriate uh, with appropriate measures for for protection of staff and children. And are you getting guidance from the Department of Education or the Federal Department of Education in terms of um, safety requirements or anything like that, or is that something that the district is developing on your own? Uh, there there's some limited guidance that we receive that we consult, uh, but uh, a lot of that we generate. Uh, through our own through our own research and, and our own devices, uh, we you know it, as I said with the with the immediacy of this crisis, we've had to address this um, in any way we can. And one of those ways is we're we're doing a lot of research on our own. So uh, we're we're looking for good information anywhere we can find it. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, we'll move on to Superintendent Holden from Sanofi. 
good morning, and, and good morning, Kevin, and thank you for taking the call. Um, so I, I echo my colleagues as far as saying that we can continue to offer our students all the services uh, that we can, and I do think that the fall will look differently for a lot of us. One of the issues that I'm very concerned with in our community, and I'm sure a lot of other folks in the state are, um, is the age of our building. We have a 90-plus year old building without proper HVAC ventilation. Um, and we're real concerned that if we do come back, how we are going to be able to um, get some of that HVAC systems into place. And as you know, the moratorium has been put on building aid in the state for quite a long time, and some of our facilities have been uh, obviously a little bit more run down than they should be. Um, so I would just ask that if you are, uh, when in Washington, if there's money available to be allocated towards um, facilities, I think that's going to be a, a real need for improvement as we continue to go through this pandemic, um, having our, our buildings well uh, ventilated, having the proper ventilations and systems in place, I think is going to be really crucial. Um, and that's one of the areas, as I said, that we are really looked at, looking at and concerned about right now in Sunapee. Yeah, that's a really good suggestion, Russ. I, you know, there's a lot of talk about funding for infrastructure as either in the next legislative package or at some point a little further down the road and providing funding that could be used to address COVID-related concerns is a really important point that we can't lose sight of. So thank you for um, pointing that out. That's actually the first time I've heard that issue and it is really important as we're seeing more and more studies about the importance of air circulation and air handling to the spread of uh, the coronavirus. Super. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, move on to Superintendent Cascaden from Bow. Good morning. Thank you for uh, letting me be on the call. Uh, Ditto to all of what my uh, colleagues have said in the state. I'm going to go in a couple new directions for you. We're concerned that we got a lot of kids in bad places coming back to us. We're concerned that, yeah. especially our special education kids, uh, you know, they've been in school with a one-on-one -on -one aid seven hours a day. They've been home basically being cared for by the parents in bad situations. we got a lot of kids with emotional issues. Uh, they had school anxiety, they were cutting, they were doing other dangerous behavior before uh, they went home, and they've been home, possibly trapped with their abusers and so forth. So we're very concerned that when kids come back into school, we're going to have a lot of needs. The safest, best place kids can be is in public school. I'm in a have district, not a have not. We were able to implement very quickly. Yeah. We have plenty of technology. We did not have to worry about feeding kids because we had very low free and reduced and our town stepped up and did that. What I'm real concerned is long-term financial implications. We need to add more counselors. We probably need to add more interventionists, more special ed people. My business administrator came in the other day and said, do you know how much sick time and vacation time we're going to have to accrue on our books going forward? I mean, it's a COVID miracle. No staff members were sick during remote instruction. And, you know, all that carries over into, into future budgets. Um, and the last thing I will say is in New Hampshire, the reopening process has been a little bit politicized. And there's a, a redesign element that people are very concerned about. And it's not that we don't see that education is going to change. We know education is going to change. And this remote instruction is going to, accelerate uh, educational uh, methodology and things like that. However, it's also tied into a, a message of privatization, of charter mm -hmm. schools. And what we've heard, like when we hear about reopening, we hear about the kid who's done better under remote instruction. We hear the kid that's done the same, but we don't hear about the kid who's really fallen apart. And there's kind of like this rosy, kind of cheery, Oh, you know, we're going to reopen and it's all going to be great. And we're going to change. And we've got this huge problem coming our way in the fall. Yeah, thanks, Dean. I, I, I appreciate your, your raising the fact that we should be looking at this not from a political perspective, but we should be looking at it from the perspective of what's in the best interest of the students. And, you know, I, some of you know that I started out as a teacher, and it was a long time ago, but... I still appreciate and I think a whole lot of parents mm. after this 
period appreciate the important role of teachers and just how hard the job is. And, you know, I always believe that the most important thing about learning for students was that teacher in the classroom. And I don't think that's changed. Now, there are great ways to use remote learning and we should continue to do that. But what we've got to do is, is look at what's going to be the best for students. And I, I so appreciate what you're saying about the need for more counselors, for more aides, for more staff to help with addressing what students have been through in this period. And, you know, everything we're reading shows that there is an increase in mental health issues for everybody. That certainly applies to children as well. And so we've got to, as we think about the future, you know, what do we need to invest in to ensure that we've got um, students who are going to be educated for the future and how do we help them? Uh, we've got to look at some of those issues and I hope in Congress we are going to make those investments because I think they're t so critical to the future of kids and to the future of the country and the state, you know. Um, the, we won't be only as successful as the next generation is and we've got to remind people of that. So, thank you. Thank you, Dean. Um, well, I'm going to go a little out of order. I'm going to call on John Goldhart, this new superintendent in Manchester. Hi, Senator. Uh, the Good morning. Issue, thank you. The biggest issue that keeps me concerned are we have a lot of students in Manchester who are highly vulnerable, who are underserved to begin with, mm -hmm. and the loss of instruction that they're getting during this time is my biggest concern because I know we're going to take a nosedive academically. We cannot, as, as much as we try in our remote learning, we cannot replace a high quality in-person teacher. Yep. And I'm concerned about when they come back, what we will, what we will be able to do in, in regards to remediation and catch up to get them back to a good place because this will have an impact for years on kids, especially next year if we, and my guess is there's probably going to be an abnormal year next year as well. Uh, that's a big concern of mine. Other issues that I've had is it's been very frustrating trying to understand how we access the CARES funds. I, I don't get a lot of answers from our state department and it's been uh, frustrating because it's uh, we would like to get moving on that and then I'm also trying to we're, we're trying to get our budgets approved and I have some aldermen who are wanting to cut our budgets at a time when we know we're going to need more funds because we may need, need more busing if we have to do social distancing uh, we may need to clean the buildings more in mm -hmm. the sanitation every day and so forth um, in regards to school nutrition I thought it would be interesting to let you know that since COVID we have delivered 200,000 meals on buses throughout the community wow. and uh, these folks have done a fantastic job and have done their very best to get these mills out to families. Southern New Hampshire University has donated 53,000 mills over the weekends for families and uh, one of our other uh, issues we have has been our technology factor. We, we've got, we've, we've been able to get the free Comcast to folks We've given out every Chromebook we have. We spent over a million dollars last year in new Chromebooks, and those are out. I don't know how many of them we'll get back. But technology hardware and also a learning management system that's better. Uh, special education services is a, another big concern and how we will be able to do com uh, compensatory services for the students who have not been able to get those services. So it's been quite an adventure, but the thing I want to really emphasize is how well people have jumped in to do what they have to do, and that's been really refreshing to see. But it, 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 we have those are our big challenges. What we'll have with costs will be transportation, technology, learning management system, dealing with special ed, mm -hmm. and remediation. Well, and as you point out, lots of um, 
communities are now going through their budget process, mm -hmm. and the, the sooner we can get this next package of legislation done, the more it will provide some certainty for um, school boards, for town councils, for selectmen on what they need to budget and how to how to support schools. One of the things that has been very frustrating, and I, I agree with you, is that the the funding that was in the CARES Act has been very slow to go out. And we will continue to push on that because it's been true of the money going to hospitals, to medical providers, to um, the only thing that seems like it's gone out fast are the business dollars, and there were some issues with those. So um, if folks stay in touch with us, we will do everything we can to try and push and get that money released. Thank you. And I don't know, let me just, I should just ask Erica or um, Ariel, have either of you heard anything from DOE or Treasury about release of funds? This is this is Erica. The Department of Education has announced that it has theoretically made these funds available to school districts, but it's my understanding that, that most districts, if not all in the state, have not gotten these funds yet. So um, we're going to definitely do what we can to see how we can get these funds out faster. Yeah, can I ask, is there anybody on the call who whose district has actually received any money? Okay, that's helpful because now we can follow up again with DOE. Great. All right, thank you, sir. Um, we will move on to Sandy McDonald, uh, Rochester. Good morning, and good morning, Senator, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of your call. Um, I would reiterate what my colleagues have said, the digital divide not being just simply mm -hmm. devices in students' hands, but uh, the connectivity through high-speed Internet. Um, I would reiterate the, the need for financial support and guidance around infrastructure and transportation um, and guidance on providing summer learning. Um, again, in the summer, the kids that need the most support are the kids that struggled the most with remote learning. So. Yeah. Uh, to provide that support in a remote learning environment is extremely challenging, um, which will which will cause um, costs to go up for sure in the fall mm -hmm. for for some of our special populations. And as those costs go up, our budgets are going down. Um, so I did hear you say that you know there's some more in money that will be coming out, and um, so my question would be. Right now, the monies that we're getting are based on pre-COVID poverty levels. And I'm wondering if perhaps those allocations could be based on COVID poverty levels. Um, because our poverty levels in our city have definitely um, gone up. We have more kids that are uh, food insecure and uh, homeless mm -hmm. um, with increased needs. And so as those numbers go up, the need goes up, but the dollars um, don't necessarily match that. Right. Um, I would also reiterate the the um, frustration in accessing CARES money. Um, we know that that money for us would be, some of that money was uh, earmarked for mental health counselors because that is a, a big area of concern for us. And we actually have lost two um, that we had on the line because we plan to use CARES money to fund them, and um, that money just hasn't come, and they have accepted different jobs. So that's a huge uh, loss. Um, that in is addition, a huge loss. It, it's huge, and you know, I can I can swallow that my technology orders are so delayed now that I likely won't get enough devices in time to start the year remotely, should we? But I'm really having a hard time swallowing the loss of mental health services in the time when we need them. Those are my big concerns. Okay, thank you. Well, we thank will, you. as I said, we will push on DOE to do everything we can to get those funds released. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Um, we'll move on to Christine Martin from Messinic Regional School District. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Senator Shaheen, thank you for everything you do for us here in New Hampshire. Um, I, I echo uh, many of I echo many of the comments of my peers 
um, more specifically to the Scenic Regional School District, however, um, is going to be cash flow issues in the fall. It's interesting to me that, um, you know, here in New Hampshire, we've skated along with this uh, education funding formula that we have that's really convoluted. But when we have trouble, like we have currently, um, that that funding formula rears its ugly head mm -hmm. on the local level. There's no question about it. I'm concerned. Uh, I have a, a large bond payment to make in September, and uh, we barely made it last year um, because of some uh, property uh, taxes not paid in one of our small communities. I'm extremely concerned this year about folks who've lost their job, uh, jobs and are going to be unable to pay their property taxes uh, in the fall. And uh, I still have a school district to run to people to pay, and I may have additional expenses. No, no. I will have additional expenses in order to service all of our students in the fall. Um, uh, the other the other piece for us uh, also is I agree the CARES Act uh, money and more specificity in uh, how we can use those monies. I, I'm holding off on technology purchases or anything of that nature because I'm not sure that in uh, rural New Hampshire what might have I might have been able to transport 50 kids with one bus. I may need three now or four. Yep. Um, uh, and so I'd like to be able to use transport, uh, money for transportation, and I can't identify that at, at this point in time. Um, so those things definitely uh, are concerning. The other piece, too, is my special education budget. And, and uh, we ended up with a default budget this year, a loss of $400,000, which in our tiny little school district is a lot of cash. Um, yep. And what kind of compensatory services will I need to provide in the fall for children who have not made progress or who have regressed? Um, and I'm, I'm, I have a, a low population of special education students. I can't believe uh, what John Goldhart uh, is going to be dealing with in the fall in Manchester. Um, so really, on our end, uh, though I would concur, with, again, with my peers, I'm incredibly proud of our learning organization and our community for stepping up to what is a very challenging situation. But from a financial standpoint, moving forward, um, it, it is a great, great concern. Um, and again, that's one, one reason that I'm hopeful that we can get additional funding for state and local governments because I think it can help with some of those other costs that all of you are facing. And one of the one of the challenges from the CARES dollars that I have been very disappointed in is the the Treasury guidance that has come out that has suggested a lot less flexibility in using those funds than I believe was the intent of Congress. So in the House bill that's coming over to the Senate, they have spelled out very specifically the intent to be provide as much flexibility for use of those state and local funds as possible. I'm hopeful that we can get something like that mirrored in the Senate so it gives flexibility for all of you to be able to use those dollars in a way that's most helpful in your communities. So I will be continuing to push on that and think that that is very important and that making sure that, uh, you know, as as you all know, if we, if we assume that we've got one big pot and if, if we're not going to provide help for communities and states and so we're going to see layoffs of um, teachers, first responders, municipal workers, um, state employees, then that doesn't help us in terms of unemployment and the other costs. So I believe it's really important for us to provide these funds to state and local governments as well. Many thanks, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, we'll move on to Kimberly Wheelock from Colbert. Good morning, Senator and um, everyone Good morning. else. Morning. It's a pleasure to listen to you and. Um, see how we're not that dissimilar from the north to the south. Um, so, I mean, I can echo similar um, to what Ron has said, access to adequate Internet service um, and technology tools has been a concern. Um, we have concerns also about summer school. Um, I think Dean Cascadden mentioned that. Um, you know, for our special needs students, we're worried about 
them losing skills and having to face a much bigger curve to overcome when school mm -hmm. resumes in the classroom, if that is indeed what happens in the fall. Um, but in addition to what else was said, I'm looking forward to next year thinking about not only building interventions for students, but we have you know several new staff members next year and thinking about ways to um, front load PD either at the start of the year or during the summer for best practices for remote learning in case we're in a similar situation. So those are kind of things I'm thinking about for the fall, um, in addition to whatever everyone else has already said. So mm -hmm. thank you. When you say you want to front load, I I didn't catch what you were saying you wanted to front load. Professional development. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and also maybe training for parents um, on different technology programs or applications that they could be using as well. Great. Great. Thank you, Ms. Wheelock. I'll move uh, up Route 3 a little bit to Bridger DeWitt from Pittsburgh. Hi. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me be on this call. Um, I kind of echo everyone else also about the Internet access and the cell phones. Um, I, I'm concerned with some social-emotional funding that we're going to need in the fall. Um, one of the things that I've been really been worried about, and I'm actually coming at this from a student standpoint is where they're going to return educationally in the fall and how do I re right. uh, re-motivate the students and one of the things that I'm concerned about uh, actually is the state testing that we're going to have to do in the in the spring it's like because I know that's going to be a lot lower than what it should be yeah is that something that has been raised with the state and with the commissioner to to address maybe pushing back the testing or looking at some sort of alternatives to considering the the loss of time in terms of education has have you all raised that um that's been talked about but i don't know if any definitive answers have come out yet uh, Senator, this is Ronnie Catera. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to address that one. Um, the Superintendents Association, the Superintendents Association has repeatedly um, brought this up um, with the Department of Education, um, particularly around SAT testing, and we did mm -hmm. receive a waiver regarding accountability. But in our call with the commissioner on Wednesday, um, excuse me, with Caitlin Davis in the Department of Education, we were told that the commissioner made a decision that we all would be mandatorily taking SAT testing in the fall. Um, we would all, instead of offering it to our students, it would be mandatory. And that's of huge concern to all of us that he made that decision because we want equity for all students to be able to have access to the SAT, um, to yep. expand their opportunities in college. But we certainly do not believe that that's the stress that we should br bring upon our students for this mandatory testing when we've been out of school for approximately six months. Sure. And we feel as if I had not heard that. Our, thank you for. Thank you. We just feel as if um, our voices are not being heard on that in our advocacy for our students. So, do you know what has been, what is the commissioner given as the reason why he thinks this is so important? Do you know? Has he given any reason? Yes, he said that he believes that this is an opportunity that we want to be sure that all um, underprivileged students have the same opportunity as those who have stronger supports at home and the ability to take the SAT, that everyone has the opportunity to take it. And none of us, none of us disagrees with that, but it should be sure. optional. And we happen to know from the, SAT, from the um, college board and Sandy McDonald can speak more articulately about it, but that they are offering waivers for students to be able to take it on Saturday. So everyone could still take the SAT and take it on Saturdays, regardless of who they are, but the decision has been made that we will all offer it. We will, it's mandatory that we all give it in the fall. Thanks. All right. Um, 
Thank you, Bridger, and thank you, Rana, for the follow-up on that. Um, we'll move on to uh, Steve Beals down in Alburn. Good morning, Senator. Uh, nice to be with morning. everyone. Good morning. I'm trying to just move uh, the conversation, not because it's more important in a different direction, but just to offer some other insights. I, I echo the comments of others. Um, my first two, my first re in real concern that I err on or talk about is I'm concerned about the mental health status of our staff members mm -hmm. as we come back to school. I certainly would not place that at a higher demand over students, which have been talked sure. about. But what I have seen through remote learning, through the different stages of we think we're going to be out this long, and then it, everybody thinks it's going to get extended through the school year, I just really um, I compliment the efforts of people, but I think it's taking an emotional, a physical health and a mental health toll on them. I think they're all in that survival mode of please get me through this school year. You have some schools that have already finished in New Hampshire. Uh, you have some schools that will be finishing earlier than anticipated. And so much of that is that protective aspect. My concern as we go forward with that staff mental health piece, and I certainly know they can access health care programs connected to our insurance plans, et cetera, but I really think it's more mm -hmm. than that. I think as the summer unfolds, uh, it has been more difficult to get people to engage into summer help. They would love to see a kid face to face, which they know isn't prudent, but trying to engage them into summer ESY remotely when they've already had this many struggles, they're shaking their hands and saying, I think I need my summer and I don't blame them. As more information comes out about what our reopening may look like, whether hybrid, whether in person, brick and mortar, whether fully remote or whatever else, I just think that that is a real concern. The second area um, that was alluded to in a large principal call with high school administrators this morning was we really believe strongly that we need to incorporate more student voice into what went well and what didn't go well with remote learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly am not underplaying this as only a high school effort. Um, we recognize at the elementary level the parents are so directly involved in those lessons and have become the homeschool parents, if you will. We, we know middle school students uh, through their developmental needs and certainly can begin the process of speaking for themselves. Um, but we feel as though um, our state needs more of what has gone well and what hasn't. Hearing those analogies of this is better for this student than traditional school, we definitely have some of those cases. We have many cases, as a previous speaker talked about, that it's about the same. But the countless number of students who have just been disengaged kids in brick and mortar school for the most part are more disengaged in remote learning. Uh, I have a senior class of about 285 students currently and our numbers of kids in disengage mode as we try to finish school for seniors this week, I have 20% of the seniors that I just am trying to put back up remediation plan. Or if there's a good news to that is we have no idea when graduation will be so we have more time to keep working with them to try mm -hmm. to progress. But not that it's a policy aspect, but having people understand student voice is paramount to decisions. When adults make decisions for all students without that voice, we tend to make decisions that are obviously in student best interest, but not necessarily fully aligned with what their voices may be saying. Boy, you're, I totally understand that. I've been on a couple of remote um, Zoom classes in the last couple of months, and one at a high, Nashua High School, um, uh, elementary school, a middle school, and when I asked the students, how many of you would rather be in class, or how many of you would rather be learning remotely, and it's almost been unanimous that students, and particularly I was surprised by the elementary kids who said that that they would much rather be in class. So um, you're absolutely right. Listening to the students who have had this experience is really important. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And we've got a little less than 15 minutes left. 
and about five more of you to go through. So we'll move on to Shannon Kruger from Allenstown. Good morning, Senator. Thanks so much Good for morning. allowing us to be on here. Um, I would reiterate what all of my colleagues have shared regarding budgetary concerns and lack of funding and future costs. Allentown is a community that has a school budget that is extremely lean with no padding. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our 2021 budget is not going to be prepared for a lot of these additional costs that we know we're going to be facing. Um, I guess the real point that I want to make um, this morning kind of goes off what Steve Beals just talked about and the mental health challenges of both um, staff and students. We have staff that are so stressed um, between their own jobs and educating their own children and, mm -hmm. you know, partners and spouses that have been laid off and now they're, you know, experiencing life issues that they haven't had to deal with before. And, you know, how do we um, maybe partner with people to get our staff um, the assistance that, that they may need moving forward, especially if we're going to re be returning to, and I, you know, I think we also will be returning to some sort of hybrid um, situation in the fall. The second piece to this is our kids. And, um, you know, we know we're going to have learning gaps and lots of intervention that is going to, you know, need to happen. However, you know, we can't teach kids if we can't reach kids. And we know that we have mm -hmm. so many kids that are going to be returning to us um, in some real dire social emotional state. And so, um, you know, we are looking at how do we get funding for additional counselors, for intervention support. Um, I've reached out to a local uh, community health agency to see can we partner for telecounseling. I mean, you know, during the day, so kids who can't, who don't have transportation or can't get there, maybe we could find ways to do that. Um, but again, it it all takes it, it all takes funding. Um, right. We have listened to our students. We are planning. We have continued all of our extracurricular activities through remote learning. So band, robotics, weekly trivia games for kids, lunch groups. We're looking at carrying that through the summer so that we can at least have eye, you know, eyes on kids um, and offer some support you know, through the things I just mentioned as well as book clubs and science clubs. Um, but again, it takes funding to pay staff or to get um, outside agencies to help us with it. Um, we're committed to that because kids have told us that that is pretty much what's gotten them through this, is being able to still mm. connect with staff. So um, I guess I would just reiterate the need for um, mental health, um, funding for mental health and social emotional needs that we're definitely are going to have to address. Otherwise, you know, they're not going to be available to learn. Thank you, Shannon. Absolutely. Thanks, Shannon. Um, well, I'll now call to uh, Barrett Christina from the school board perspective. Thank you, Senator, uh, for the opportunity to comment and to hear our concerns. Um, first, uh, the New Hampshire School Boards Association is in complete concurrence um, with all the comments uh, that have been offered, and it's wonderful mm -hmm. to hear from principals, superintendents, school board members to get sort of the whole picture of, of what our districts are going to be facing, um, or what they're facing now, and, and certainly what the future holds. Um, I, without being repetitive, I, I want to identify just three quick areas to put on your radar. Um, the first is if we do reopen schools at some point, whether or not that's in the fall or January, um, our districts are going to need money for um, PPE, for cleaning, yeah. for sanitary supplies, things of that nature. Um, senators, you know, you may know um, our school nurses are often the first line of health care mm -hmm. in this country for a lot of kids. Um, kids that don't have insurance, kids that don't have a car to get to a, a, a you know a, a, a clinic, um, it's the school nurse that's taking their temperature. So we're going to need 
thermometers, we're going to need masks, we're going to need sanitizer, we're going to have to clean the school significantly at the end of every day, perhaps more so than we ever have before. So there's going to need um, money or a mechanism to get these sorts of supplies into, into local school districts. Um, the second aspect, um, it, with the state of the economy um, and, you know, New Hampshire's um, long tradition of school funding challenges, uh, school boards across the state are significantly concerned, not just that local revenues are going to be down. Um, as some of the previous speakers have mentioned, if you can't pay your local property taxes or your mortgage, you're not getting that yeah. money into the schools to fund the school. Um, so the, the larger issue is with revenue, we presume that revenues are going to be down for the state as well, too. Um, and as well, the state gave us about $138 million extra money this biennium. We're certainly not anticipating that's going to be um, long-term spending, especially if, if revenues are down and the state of the economy stays somewhat where it is. So circling back, Senator, I'm sure you remember in 2009 when um, the era uh, was the Recovery Act and yeah. the Obama administration passed, New Hampshire was able to earmark, I forget the exact amount, I want to say 130 or $140 million of ERA money basically to fill in state obligations for adequate education uh, obligations. So um, that may be one idea to consider and talk about with your colleagues, both at the state and federal level as well, too, if there's more money for something like that and if we can use that money to backfill um, state budgets. So, um, and last, uh, as everybody has talked about the wonderful work our teachers across the state are doing um, and the social emotional toll that is you know, occurring with them as they're trying to manage not just their students, but in many cases their own families as well too. Uh, we know that teachers have, um, you know, had to up their data plans, data, data usage plans for their cell phones. They've um, upped uh, to, you know, a higher level of internet access through their Comcast account. So if there'd be some way we could offer some sort of tax credit or tax scholarship or whatever you want to call it uh, to a little bit to put a little bit more money um, in the hands of, of, of some of these teachers that have gone through um, great efforts and great expense of their own to make sure that their kids and their students are still um, having access to uh, what level of education can be provided today. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barrett. Um, Joe Lentini from uh, Conway School Board. Okay, we'll move on to Shannon Barnes then from Merrimack. Thank you very much, and thank you for asking me to join. Um, I echo everything you're saying for the administrative side, and I just wanted to kind of look at it from the uh, the school board side a little bit, and uh, a couple I'm sorry, of things Joe that Joe I'll come in after that. Oh, sorry, Joe. <laughs> sure. Um, so when we talk about food insecurity, uh, Merrimack is not really. You know, we know that it came up earlier that there are families that are coming into this that were not food insecure and now are. But also, I think that there are people that have reduced hours, so they may not. You know, of course, in Southern New Hampshire, the cost of living can be pretty steep. So what would be considered a free and reduced lunch, um, you know, eligibility may still create a great financial hardship for those, especially as the price of everything other than gas is going up. So something to consider that we are doing everything we can to offer foods to students, and we would love to see what we can do um, to extend that into the summer. Uh, we know that, um, you know, we're getting a lot of feedback from, you know, what I would call a small but loud constituency that says that we're not here to to feed America, but we know who's hungry faster than anybody else. So I, I just wanted to bring that up. Um, the other thing that I think that hit us in the face was um, not having one-to-one -one as a standard for our students uh, with devices. Uh, not only did we have to deploy a lot of Chromebooks, et cetera, but there was the haves and the have-nots, and their ability to ramp up to learning was definitely palatable because for those who had the technology at home and used the technology at home to continue to learn, um, didn't have to become uh, familiar with the technology as part of ramping up to remote learning. So there was definitely um, the haves and the have-nots had a different ramp up, I think, in some ways. So anything we can do to create a one-to-one -one device environment for public education, I think it's going to be very valuable to, I mean, not just Merrimack, 
but going forward to everyone. Because again, we're working off of the same platform and then we can teach to, to a consistency where with all your BYOs plus whatever we've deployed created a lot of um, what I would call, you know, hurdles. Um, the one thing, uh, the one thing I'll talk about with taxpayer um, struggles, you're right, we're talking about lack of revenue, but um, we're talking about how funds are going to the state and local government. And something to consider is, um, you know, especially when it's not a city environment like most of New Hampshire isn't, I think the town does not take the time or has the insight. And I think cities have the same problem with their city councils, but that they look at the school as the heavy burden to the tax bill. So they're not looking at what it takes to deliver an education, the funds it's required, where those funds go. They don't get into the weeds of it. So, you know, when you look at like a town like Merrimack, every uh, tax bill they put into the bill, you know, if you have a problem with your tax bill, here's where the money's going. So call those that are asking for the money. So when you're talking about the money going to the local counselor, uh, counselor select board, they're not necessarily going to be quick to say, hey, education, what do you need from us? Um, I don't think that that's necessarily environmentally, politically, how things are. So that's something is the money is going to, you know, the town government don't expect that it's going to come to the schools. And I think the other thing that you're dealing with, with town governments versus schools, towns hold a surplus. Our town has, I think, over $60 million in surplus that they hold for emergencies. And we don't have that. Um, so when we go low, it's coming from within the, the dollars that we have budgeted or that we have you know, to, to use. So we're not in the same place to say we can dip into an emergency fund when there's a, a lack. And when it comes to things like special education, there's no, there's no flexibility, nor is there a desire to say no. So we have a lot to think about with, with um, you know, where the money goes. And if the money doesn't come to the board, to the district, it might not make it there through other means. So those were the biggest things I would say that um, we have concerns about. Um, but Again, you know, wherever we, we can uh, give you the insights that you need, we appreciate you taking this time to, to ask us. Well, thank you, Shannon. That's an important reminder. You may remember I, I was governor during this initial school funding suit, so I, yes, I have you are. seen firsthand some of those very difficult challenges, and I appreciate what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Um, Joe? Yes, uh, again. Thank you for having me on. Um, again, yeah. I agree with everything that's been stated so far, but of course, funding is an issue on multiple um, in multiple areas. And what I really feel is needed is very clear guidance from the state and federal levels. Um, when schools open, what are the parameters? Um, you know, we're going to need to disinfect schools buses multiple times, ultimately when you open, what are the clear parameters on those? We're going to need to have washing stations, touchless paper towels, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All school districts are going to need to work together, but how can we work together if we're not working on the same page? If we're all coming up with our own plans, that's so inefficient. Um, you know, of course, technology, we need to assure adequate bandwidth. You know, I live in Conway. It's good sometimes, it's not others. Mm -hmm. And then feeding children is so critical right now. Families are struggling, and it's not going to get better. So how are we going to continue to – kids are not going to learn if they can't eat. So, you know, I just want to finish up reiterating, we need clear guidance. We need to work together, and we need to all be working on the same page. Yeah, I I completely agree with that, Joe. It's been frustrating to see at the federal level in so many ways. The guidance that we were hoping for from CDC has not been forthcoming, and, in fact, it's been watered down in ways that make it much less helpful. So we I agree. We need to continue to demand that we get the guidance to be helpful to everybody in figuring this out because – we are much better at doing it collectively than we are at doing it individually. Thank you, Joe, um, and thank, thank you for being able to jump on at the last minute. And uh, we'll finish it up with Carl Lass from the New Hampshire School Administrators Association. Uh, hi, Senator Shaheen. Thanks very much for um, allowing me to be part of the call. 
uh, thank you for your continued support of public education in New Hampshire, uh, and especially requesting this call and taking the time to hear directly from the leaders uh, who are charged with making all of this work under uh, these extreme set of circumstances. Um, you are, uh, you and uh, your congressional uh, delegation uh, are doing a great job of, of listening uh, to leaders in the field. Um, I wish that was more uh, the norm here at the, at the state level. Um, I think that what you've heard today really highlights the complexities that districts are facing, um, but it also puts a pretty bright spotlight on some of the systemic failures in supporting students and families, mm -hmm. uh, both at the state and federal level, uh, especially around equitable access uh, instruction to special services, to mental health, um, and it, it really spotlights, I think, Herculean efforts to get through this um, to best meet the needs of all of our kids. Uh, I think it's a little unfortunate that the political messaging and the pushing uh, agendas of redesign and choice uh, are overshadowed with the needs of our most vulnerable students and families. Um, and I think that the, the main emphasis is the fund uh, in order to meet this uh, growing remediation need um, and compensatory ed need as we reopen. Yeah, I'm sorry, Carl, um, you're cutting in and out a little bit. Okay. I, just want, I just want to reiterate that um, the, the folks in the field are doing an outstanding job uh, under very difficult circumstances. Uh, and really what we're looking for is a partnership and a clear dialogue with uh, the federal and the state uh, DOEs uh, around how can we uh, best meet the needs of all children uh, regardless of their circumstances. Safe, uh, full, however it looks. And I know that you're on a tight time frame, so um, I'm just going to end it there. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to everybody who has been on the call. I've heard a lot of very helpful suggestions about what we ought to be thinking about in Washington. I, I know that funding is a huge challenge, and as um, several people have pointed out, um, we need to make sure that funding that is uh, supposed to be going to schools is actually directed that way, so maybe providing not just flexibility for how dollars are used, but providing some more direction on ensuring that funding that's meant for schools actually gets there. Um, so as we, as we are negotiating around this package of legislation that has come over from the House, all of your suggestions are really helpful and we will, I will be continuing to fight to do everything I can to help ensure that you get help as you're dealing with some of these huge challenges. And I know all of my staff who is on the call and those who are not will be doing the same thing. So if there are, if there are specific um, questions or concerns that you have over the next um, month or so or at any time, feel free to call our staff. The more, the more specifics we know about what you're facing, the better I can advocate to help um, to help all of you as we think about what we're doing in Washington. So thank you all so much for taking the time for the great job that you are doing and that your teachers and families and your communities are doing. I know this is um, a really difficult, uh, very stressful time. And the fact that people have been, have stepped up and are doing everything that they can is really impressive. And I will be there to support you in every way that I can. So thank you all so much.